time to get off the fence. And here I had them build me a fence. So I could sit up here and preach. And they're hoping I don't fall off of it. <laughs> so now you see here we've got God's kingdom. And over here we've got the world. And sooner or later you've got to make your mind up where you're going to stand. We can't be in the kingdom on Sunday. And then... In the world on Monday. <laughs> we got to make a decision if we're going to be Christians that we're going to be Christians and act like Christians all the time. Not just when we're around our Christian friends. What that's called is compromise. And the world's full of it today. But there's nothing in the Bible that ever encourages it or ever approves of it. And compromise means to go just a little bit below what you know is right. It's kind of like that just once lie that Satan told Jesus when he was in the wilderness those 40 days. If you'll bow down and worship me just this once, I'll give you all of this. We are living in the worst of times and the best of times. The conditions in our world today are desperate, and it's not just here in the United States, it's basically pretty much everywhere. And there's a huge movement everywhere from the devil, from the pit of hell, to get God out of everything. But God is not going anywhere. He started it, and he will be around to finish it. Amen. But we do have a job to do, and I say it's the best of times because it's the best of times for the kingdom of God because I believe that there will be one of the greatest ingathering of souls ever in any other time in history. And you may think this is a tough time to be alive. I think we say that sometimes, this is a tough time to be alive. But actually, it is an honor for us to be chosen by God to be alive at this time in history in the earth. I said it is an honor to be chosen by God. But probably more than any other time in history, God's depending on us to make his name famous. He's depending on us to make people hungry and thirsty by the way we live our lives. Not just by the way we preach. Preaching is good. We need that. We need to talk to one another. It's good to talk to the lost. But talking with no walking <laughs> is pretty much useless. That's called hypocritical Christianity. And there's nothing that disgusts the lost more than a, hypocritic, a hypocritic, hypocritical Christian. Amen? And they don't want us on the fence. They will tempt you to compromise and disrespect you when you do. Now, did you hear what I said? The very same people that tempt us to compromise will disrespect us when we do. It's almost like a test. It's like the devil testing us through them. And I really do believe, and it took them quite a while to build this thing, but I really do believe that if you look at this all night, maybe you'll get the point that sadly this is where a lot of Christians live. I mean, honestly, they do. Lukewarm. But Jesus said, I'd rather you be either red hot or ice cold, but whatever you do, don't be lukewarm. You know, we like a good cold drink and we like a good hot drink, but nobody likes a... <laughs> now, I'm going to go read you those scriptures in just a minute, but to be honest with you, I have never really had the courage to study out what spew you out of my mouth means. Nor am I interested in finding out. I just know that I'm going to be red hot, so I'm not taking a chance. <laughs> Either way. 
Now, how many of you know what I mean by sitting up here on this fence when I say that people kind of stay on the fence? You know, they're just, they're just kind of maybe saved enough to not go to hell. <laughs> I say this, and it's very true. Before I was filled with the Holy Spirit in 1976, just floating along in my religious boat, I did love Jesus. I did. But I didn't love him with my whole heart. I didn't wholly belong to him. I had the Holy Spirit because if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit didn't have me. He had me on Sunday morning for a little while. But he didn't have all of me. And I always say that I had enough of Jesus to stay out of hell, but not enough to walk in victory. Come on. And I, I, if you live that way and I'm your teacher, it's not going to be my fault if you stay that way. Because I'm going to do my best to share what I believe that God puts in my heart. Not necessarily what you want to hear all the time, but what I believe God puts in my heart. Because we are living in desperate times. And if, if you're on the fence, I am going to do my best to kick you off on the right side of it tonight. And that's God's kingdom. Amen. Now, you say, well, I thought we we're talking about the mind. Well, we are. And we're taking Colossians 3, 1 and 2 as our foundation scripture for tonight. And it says, if you have been raised with Christ, how many of you are born again? Okay, so we're talking to you. If you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your minds and keep them set on things that are above, not on things upon the earth. And set your mind and keep them set on things that are above and not on things upon the earth. Now that doesn't mean that we just go around thinking about heaven and angels and what it's going to be like when we die and go to heaven. But it means to get your mind onto what's important in life and off of things that are trivial and useless. And to be honest, and I've done it myself too, sometimes we just waste way too much time even thinking about our silly little problems. Because the more we think about God and the more we're intent on growing His kingdom, the more He'll solve our problems. Amen? There's nothing stronger than a made-up mind. It's really amazing to me the power. You really are stronger than you think you are. And I don't yet understand this mind and what all it's capable of. But I'm telling you, when you make your mind up. Now, I'm not saying that we can do anything apart from God or just by mind control. But anything that God wants us to do, He gives us the ability to do it. However, we've got to get on His side of it and agree with Him wholeheartedly, starting with our mind, I set my will to do the will of God. God has given us a free will. And it's a privilege, but it's also a tremendous responsibility. Amen? I can do whatever I want to do. But the Bible says you will reap what you sow. That's a spiritual law. Just like gravity, if I throw it up in the air, it's going to come down. We will reap what we sow. And so I firmly believe in setting my mind and keeping it set. And it works in my life in lots of little, different little practical areas. But I'm going to tell you somebody else's story besides mine tonight because I think it's interesting. One of the attorneys for our ministry, his wife never would fly. She was afraid to fly. She would not fly, would not fly, would not fly. So for years, because of his business, he had to travel a lot by himself. And she stayed home, did a great job of raising their kids. And the only way that they could ever go on a trip together would be if they drove. So they didn't take very many long trips. And uh, I gave her my whole best speech about doing it afraid. And she agreed with me. Yeah, 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 I need to do it afraid. But she just never could do it. And so now all of a sudden I hear a few weeks ago that... She's flying all over the place with Tom. They're just going all the time. And I'm like, well, what happened? So they're here this week, and I said to her last night, so what happened? I hear you're flying. She said, I just made my mind up. 
And she and, and I thought this was funny too. She said, one of my friends said, oh, you just decided to do it afraid. She said, no, I'm not doing it afraid. I'm just doing it. And I really like that. I'm just doing it. I'm not even going to mess with doing it afraid. I'm just doing it. And I'll tell you the truth. When the people were looking for a miracle from Jesus, and I think it's in, I know it's, I think it's in John chapter 3 maybe, and they wanted him to turn the water into wine for the wedding, the mother of Jesus said to the people that were there, whatever he says to you, do it. If you want a miracle in your life, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, if you say it to you, you're not going to be able to do it. But if he says it to you, anything that God says to you, the power comes with it to perform it if you're willing to set your mind and keep it set on things that are above. We could save ourselves so much misery if we would just set our minds. Dave loves his sports and he especially loves to play golf. And I said to Dave one day, I said, have you ever thought, I said, how hard would it be for you? You know, as you're getting older, if you would get to the point where you couldn't play golf. He said, oh, I've already thought about all that. And he said, I've got my mind set, I'll be just fine. Well, what do most of us think? Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do when my kids leave. I don't know what I'm going to do. Boy, I'm getting older now. I guess I won't be able to do anything. Life's over. I'm 70. You know, oh my. Woe is me, oh my soul, 10,000 reasons to moan and groan. <clears throat> Amen. And somebody of him could think, what in the world am I going to do? You know, maybe he has a little ache or pain. Oh, what am I going to do? You know, recently he pulled a muscle in his back trying to play golf. And so for, I don't know, a couple months on and off, he'd go out to play golf. And that would mess his game up and, you know, different things happen. And he's always, he's just like, it'll get better. It'll get better. It'll get better. But see, he's already made his mind up. He's already set his mind that if his circumstances change, he is not going to be miserable. He's already made his mind up. And some of you need to make your mind up tonight about some things in your life and maybe even some things that you are thinking may be coming up in your future and you're already getting into fear about those things. You need to say right now, I am stronger than I think I am. And whatever comes my way, I can do whatever I need to do through Christ who is my strength. You know what? We just think too much. And there's something in particular that I want us to make our minds up about tonight. Now, I've already made my mind up about this. I've had a few meetings with myself in the last year. Something I think we all need to do. You know, it takes some time to have a meeting with yourself. Set an appointment and say, self, come and let's chat. <laughs> and I've thought about what's happening in the world and just a lot of things that are being kind of vaguely threatened. You know, the time may come when laws are going to be made about what we can and can't preach. We don't know for sure what all is going to happen, but I think we have to set our minds ahead of time that we're here to serve God, not man. And I, you know, I'm going to say a few things tonight that you're going to figure out real quick. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, the government doesn't tell us what to believe and what not to believe. God does. Amen. And every single one of us better make up our mind about that. The government is not God. God is God. And I don't care if it's this nation or if it's Africa or India or Europe or wherever, wherever it's at. God is God. The governments of none of those nations are God. And we cannot bow down to them and we cannot worship them and we cannot look to them to fix all of our problems. I cannot even imagine... How it wounds God, who has given us everything, when we look past Him to some other institution to take care of us and solve our problems. And so I've got my mind made up what I'm going to do, and I hope that you'll make your mind up tonight. What happens if you've got a job and 
the boss wants you to lie for him on a regular basis. <laughs> well, I can't lose my job. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm figuring it's going to get kind of quiet in here tonight. <laughs> well, if my wife calls, just tell her that I'm not here, that I'm out. It's a lie. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. Hmm. This is going to be fun, isn't it? <laughs> what if your boss wants you to help him steal something? The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> well, you know what? You better be willing to lose your job rather than sin against your own conscience. That's what a compromise is when we sin against our own conscience. And you've heard me tell this story, but I'm going to tell the quick version. I had a job many, many, many years ago. This was back, I guess, in the early 70s. And even though at that time I was just what I would call a religious Christian, I did have a certain fear of God and I didn't want to offend him. And I had a job and my boss, I was a bookkeeper, and my boss wanted me to zero out somebody's credit balance so they didn't realize that we owed them money, that they had overpaid their account. And that we really, in effect, should be sending them a check back. And he didn't want them to see the credit balance because he didn't want them to ask for a check. So every month at the end of the month, when I would prepare the statements, he'd go over them before they were mailed out. And he started making corrections to these credit balances and wanted me to debit them out so they were just zero balances and send out the statement. Well, I knew I'd be helping him steal their money. And, you know, I had every kind of conversation with myself that anybody could have that day trying to find a way that I could do it and not be offensive to God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I needed the job. It was a good job. Dave and I only had one car and this job. We were both working in the same area. I mean, I could think of all the reasons why I had to have that job. I had just committed to about $1,200 worth of work on my teeth. And that was... A whole lot more money back then than it is now and they were in the middle of doing the work and I had to finish it and I wouldn't have the money to finish it if I quit that job and I couldn't sleep that night and I tossed and I turned and I finally came to a decision that even if I lost my job I couldn't help him steal that money now I, you can think what you want to I think that that was a test for me that if I wouldn't have passed, I might not be here tonight. Now, that's just what I think. So, let me tell you something. You have no idea how many great things God has in store for you. And some of the things that you bow down to now may keep you from the fullness of your destiny. And so we need to always go with God and never go with the flesh. The mind of the flesh is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. Well, we can reason out so many things. I could reason that out. Well, Dave and I both work down here and we don't have another car and I can't afford to lose this job. And nah, 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 nah. But you know, it's useless to try to talk God out of being honest. <laughs> because He just is. And so I finally made that decision. And you know, when you're wrestling with God and you make a decision to do what's right, peace comes back, doesn't it? And I know that with this many people in this room... And this is being streamed live on God TV, so it's really going all over the world. I know that there are people that are wrestling right now with issues. And you're in your mind reasoning and reasoning and reasoning about why it would be okay to do it. Well, everybody does it. God doesn't care how many everybody's. He's talking to you. And if you're the only person that will stand up and shine for Christ in the earth today, then I'm challenging you tonight to shine. Amen. And they've got some kind of a little thing that they're wanting you to do. Hashtag shine. And not while I'm preaching, but tonight when I'm done. If you've made your decision, not while I'm preaching. <laughs> if you've made your decision that you're going to shine brighter than ever for Jesus, then you hashtag shine and let the world know I'm taking a stand. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to be lukewarm. I'm getting off the fence. I'm going to shine. Because we are the light of the world. Amen. So I went in to my Jewish boss the next morning. Got to work real early. And I said, you know, 
I'm a Christian. Not that I thought that would impress him, but I said, I'm a Christian. And I was shaken so hard, I was so scared. I said, I'm a Christian and I can't zero this balance out because I feel like I'd be helping you steal. And I said, I know that we don't believe the same way. But I said, it would go against my conscience if I did this. And I said, I don't want to lose my job, but I can't do this. Well, he sputtered and popped and told me, well, get out there and go back to work. And I kept waiting all day to be fired. I thought at any moment he'd come out and fire me. It was almost time to get off work. And he came out and he put that statement down on my desk. He said, just send him a check. <laughs> now, listen. Over the next few years, I kept being promoted, 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 promoted. And I did not have the qualifications or the education to do the job that they promoted me into. I ended up being second in charge. Nobody had more power in the whole company than me except him. And it went back to the fact that even though he didn't agree with my Christianity, he respected me because I stood up for what was right. Now, but then the other side of it is, is we also know people who have taken a stand. I'm calling people tonight to take a stand. And I don't know what this is going to mean to you tonight, but if it means nothing to you tonight, it's going to mean something to you in the future. Because the times are coming when we're going to have to make decisions. We're going to have to make decisions to get out of relationships. We're going to have to make decisions to find some new friends. We're going to have to make decisions to uh, behave ourselves in a different way than what we do. Not go to some places that maybe we go to. We're going to have to make decisions that we're going to stand strong. Not be obnoxiously religious, but take a stand for what you believe in and stand strong. Amen. And you know what? You want to do that. You do. You want to do that. This is not going to be a discouraging message for you. Every one of you, you want to do that. But sometimes we just need somebody to push us off the fence a little bit and say, you know what? You do it in your, your, your corner of the world, even if you have to do it by yourself. And if I have to do it by myself, I'll do it in my corner of the world. And maybe you've got to do it in your family and you think you're by yourself. But really, we're all over the place and we're all together. And we're one big family. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. I get embarrassed for God. The way people talk and the things they say about Him... The language that people use today and the rudeness. And sometimes I just feel like I need to protect God. <laughs> Which of course I know is foolish, but I think he wants us all to have that attitude. That we need to protect God's reputation. Here's, you know, Christianity's reputation in the world is not all that great. And that reflects on the Lord. And it's time for us to get off the fence. It's time for us to make a decision where we're going to stand and to shine and to shine brightly. You've got to make your mind up. Revelation 3.15. Might as well start in the good book. <laughs> Let's just get right over here with the woes right off the bat. Verse 15, I know your record of works and what you're doing. Turn to the person next to you and say, God knows what you're doing. Hmm. That, that should just kind of scare some of us. <laughs> you know, when you go inside and shut the door to your house and become a different human being than the one you are on Sunday morning. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about. God still knows what we're doing. And I know that you're neither cold nor hot, and I would that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm, <laughs> and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and grown wealthy, and I am in need of nothing. This reminds me so much of the United States. <laughs> we're prosperous, we've, we've got it all together. We're the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And boy, is that theory going down the tubes. 
And I am in need of nothing. And you do not realize and understand that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. <laughs> wow. Therefore, I counsel you to purchase from me, capital M, this is God speaking, <laughs> gold refined and tested by fire. Now, I just might as well tell you that I already am gathering material to teach my series that I am going to put together on the fire of God. Because it's time for us to have it. When the fire of God comes into your life, it burns up everything that's not consistent with God's nature and it sets on fire whatever happens to be left. And I know about it because I've had it. Now Jesus said, or John said of Jesus, He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And you know what? We don't hear enough about that. We don't even hear enough anymore about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because everybody wants to be politically correct. Not say anything that's going to shake up any other denomination other than your own. You know what? All this denomination stuff is nonsense anyway because it's not, there's not going to be any in heaven. Amen. It's just so silly. Well, you know, you speak in tongues and I don't speak in tongues and you believe in healing and I don't believe in healing so I can't talk to you. i got to put up a wall. You can't come into my group. If somebody's functioning at a gift of the Spirit and you don't know anything about the gifts of the Spirit instead of judging them and thinking they're crazy, why don't you say, man, I'd like to know more. Check it out in the Bible. You know, I heard this sometime this past year and it really meant a lot to me. Actually, I was over in London doing a, a conference and actually with a lot of high-ranking officials in the Catholic Church and so I don't know what I was doing there, but anyway, we had a great time. And uh, I mean, it was like the confessor to the Pope and an archbishop of something else and an archbishop of something else. I mean, everybody had a title and then there was me, Joyce, <laughs> from Fenton. <laughs> So I, I got up and I said, well, you know what? I'm from St. Louis and we've got the arch. So I'm the Archbishop of St. Louis. That's what I told the crowd. So I, I'm now the Archbishop of St. Louis. But anyway, the one of the men that were speaking told a story and I thought it was, or he did, wasn't a story. He just said, you know what? He said, we've got to stop fighting. We may not all believe exactly the same, but we all serve the same God. Amen. And let me tell you something. Until we stop fighting amongst ourselves and begin to love each other, the world is going to think we are nothing but a big joke. Amen. So I'm just going to tell you, ahead of don't ever come to me and say anything about anybody from another denomination because I don't want to hear it. I'm not getting into it. I, I, I really, to be honest with you, I don't have that kind of stuff in my heart. It's not in me. I don't, I mean, I, I just don't get into that. I don't, how can you just hate somebody because they're a different denomination than you are? You know, that's about as goofy as not liking somebody because they've got a different color skin than you do. I mean, it, it's just all, all this stuff is demonic. It's just the enemy and we have to stop buying into it. take a stand and I say it needs to start here. At least we can be part of the fire. And he said, you know what? When the terrorists are lining Christians up and shooting them because they're Christians, they don't stop and ask, what denomination are you? He said, they think we're one. We're the only ones that don't get it. Amen. Jesus prayed that we would all be one, even as he and the Father were one. Paul prayed that we would get along, that we would have humble minds and get along. And so here we're back to the mind again. The only way that you can truly love somebody that's not like you is to have a humble enough mind to realize that whatever you are is a gift from God. 
and whatever they're not is not something that they can help. God didn't maybe give them what you have, but he gave them something else you don't have, and that's why we need to work together. And you know what? There'll probably be people here tonight that somebody brought you as a guest or, I don't know, you're curious, whatever. And You know what? You're going to be making a big mistake just because you don't understand everything we're doing or because it's not done that way in your church if you go home with a judgmental, critical attitude. Because the minute that you become offended, you can't grow and you can't learn what God wants you to learn. And Satan wants us to be offended. So that's one of the things that the fire of God needs to burn out in our lives. Let me tell you something. I am baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I do believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And I do believe everything that the Bible has to say. And I'm not going to change my mind. And I'm not ashamed of it. But you don't have to be exactly like me for me to love you. I'm going to love you anyway. Even if you don't love me, I'm going to love you. And you know why I can say that? Because I not only got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I also got the baptism of fire. I didn't know I was going to get that. I think we think... Oh, yes, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. <laughs> Whatever reason. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. We'll tell you about that tomorrow. <laughs> You'll think, wait a minute, baptizing the Holy Spirit? I was baptized in water. Does that count? What was she talking about? Well, see, that's the problem. We don't even know half the time what the Bible has to say because some of our denominations don't open us up to, uh, to those things. And then we, we're just like, well... Listen, it's sad, but I remember when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I got asked to leave my church. And you know what they told me? And this is pathetic. They said, we cannot deny that what you're saying happened to you is in the Bible, but it's not part of our doctrine. That is the absolute saddest thing that I've ever seen. And I'll tell you what, you better go with God, not doctrine. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm taking way too long with my opening, so I don't know. You may have to get part two tomorrow. And I'll tell you what, after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I had about three or four weeks and the fire of God hit me. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean God just started messing in my business. And I mean, it wasn't stuff that I wanted him to get into. But I couldn't seem to keep him out. And let me tell you something, if you want to go all the way with God, and I guess I'm asking tonight, is there anybody in here who wants to go all the way with God? Or do you want to stay on the stupid fence? It's time to get off of this fence and make your mind up where you're going to stand. We don't need to whisper when we talk about God. Now, we don't need to get out in the world and act like idiots, but we, we don't need to act like we're ashamed of the God that we serve. It's time. It's time for us to shine. And you know, some of you, what I'm saying tonight's tearing you apart because you know it's going to require some big decisions out of you. Let me tell you something. There is so much sloppy living in the body of Christ. And I, okay, we'll say it's none of you, but maybe it's somebody watching on TV. <laughs> but it's true. And we shouldn't be like that. We need to want to be like Christ in every area of our lives. And you'll be tested with fire that you may be truly wealthy and white clothes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nudity from being seen and salve to put on your eyes that you may see. If you notice in verse 18, he says, I counsel you to purchase these things from me. Well, how do we purchase these things? Not with money, but by laying your will on the altar and saying, God, your will be done and not mine. I lay my life on the altar and I want what you want, even if I don't like it. Listen, I tell God all the time, 
You do what you want to in my life, and if you have to, you tie me to the altar, but don't you dare let me go until you finish doing what you want to do in me, because I don't want to be anything other than what you want me to be. Verse 19, those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults. <laughs> and I convict and convince and reprove and chasten. I discipline and I instruct. Now watch this. So be enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. You're going to leave and say, I heard the best message tonight I've ever heard in my life about getting off the fence and inviting the fire of God into your life. Be enthusiastic and in earnest and burning with zeal and repent, changing your mind. <laughs> you know, really, you know what salvation really is? You don't just say, I want Jesus. <laughs> we, we've turned altar calls into something different than what they should be. And to be honest with you, I don't even see an altar call in the Bible. I mean, we're really just trying to bring people to a decision. But the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that He was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. But let me tell you something. Repentance means you change your mind about how you're going to live. You change your mind and you're going to go in a totally different direction. And so I want some repentance in this place tonight. And those of you that are watching by TV, you can find your own altar. Maybe you need to just bow down where you're at at home right now. Let's come to a point where we say, God, your will be done in my life. Not mine, but your will be done. Be enthusiastic so I can go on to the next point. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days will come and set in perilous times of great stress and trouble. Hard to deal with and hard to bear. Great stress. Great stress. <laughs> Let me tell you, we live in times of stress. Times that are difficult and hard to bear. And we cannot use it as an excuse to be ungodly. For people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered, lovers of money, aroused by an inordinate, greedy desire for wealth, proud and arrogant and contemptuous boasters. I mean, the list is just awful. Verse 3, they will be without natural human affection, callous, inhuman, relentless, slanderers, troublemakers, accusers, uncontrolled, fierce, haters of good. And, you know, we're thinking, man, the world is a mess. Yes, Joyce, that's the way the world is. The world is a mess. Verse 4, they will be treacherous, betrayers, rash, inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. Uh-oh. Verse 5, for although they hold a form of religion... You think he's talking about some Christians? For although they hold a form of religion, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. In other words, go to church on Sunday and act like everybody else on Monday. I did it for years and years and years. I mean, I tell you what, I could be so spiritual around my Christian friends. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We bring the sacrifice of praise. <laughs> but I tell you, I wasn't sacrificing at home. Let me tell you something. If there were two pieces of meat on the platter, I took the best one and I gave Dave the worst one. <laughs> Come on. Selfish, self-centered Christians. Don't act like you don't do that kind of stuff. Don't even act like it. Hide the last piece of cake for yourself. And then go tell everybody you don't eat dessert. 
Christian liars. Okay, here, here's what... Here's what happens. We're supposed to be lights. But if I got dirt all over my bulb... <laughs> now see, I got a light in me. I'm born again. But it's not helping anybody else because I'm all caked over with all this junk from the world that I hang out in all the time. And this doesn't help anybody or affect anybody. And even if I kind of ramp it up as high as I think I can get it. Man, I'm not only going to church once a week now, I'm going twice a week and I sing in the choir and I'm an usher, a greeter at the door. Woo! Look at me. Christian, Christian. And I've got a bumper sticker and a pair of cross earrings and all of Joyce's books. So what? I'm going to try real hard. <laughs> I'm going to try real hard. But what happens if you invite the fire of God into your life? <laughs> and you know, it, it starts out a little... Little fire, little more light. Little more fire, little more light. Little more fire, little more light. Oh my God, I don't think I can take any more. Little more li fire, little more light. Little more fire, little more light. Little more fire, little more light. Wow, all of a sudden, I'm been affecting people and people's lives around me are changing. Amen? Okay, now let me tell you something. Jesus is coming back. And you know what? I've made a decision and I've talked to God about this. I'm making a commitment to start talking about that more in my preaching. I'm not saying I'm going to start preaching on end times all the time, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep reminding people Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Do you know that they talked about that all the time in the New Testament? Paul talked about it all the time. Peter talked about it all the time. It's, the Bible's full of it. In, in 1 Thessalonians, every single book, it talks about how Jesus is coming back soon. They lived not sitting on the fence, but they lived on full alert, on guard, ready, doing the very best that they could to serve God with their whole hearts because their preachers were constantly telling them, Jesus is coming back soon. Yeah. Jesus is coming back soon. Let me ask you a question. What would change in your life if you knew for sure that Jesus was returning in three days? I asked myself that question last week. And there was only one thing that I thought I would need to change. And you know what? I'm not telling you that to impress you. I'm telling you that because I've had the fire of God in my life. And let me tell you what. It is not easy, but it is worth it. I've had to walk away from a lot of things and spend a lot of time by myself and be judged and criticized and... Oh my gosh, you don't even want to know what all I've gone through trying to get from where... I mean, just trying to learn how to be a submissive wife I thought would kill me. Just absolutely, totally, completely annihilate me and kill me. And you've heard my stories. I mean, you've heard me preach how I laid on the floor one day in my office and hung onto the legs of my desk because God was telling me that I needed to submit to Dave about something and I was like, ooh... I mean, I did this. I said, God, please help me to do your will and not run away from you. Let me tell you something. You better get radical. You know what? You will get so happy if you will get your mind off yourself and get totally focused on Jesus. 
You will get so happy if you get your mind off yourself and spend your days thinking about what you can do to help somebody else. Get out in the world and shine. You say, I don't know what I'm called to do. You're called to shine. See, I'm concerned that if we don't make a decision that things are going to slip up on us unawares. This is why Paul taught the people all the time, be watchful, be on your guard, don't be deceived. He's going to come back like a thief in the night at a time when people are comfortable and just going about their business. You know, while you're on your social media and you're taking selfies and you're hashtagging everything and <laughs> checking out Pinterest and checking out what I don't know, you know, I, I can't keep up with all of it, but you know, people are so caught up in that today and it's a great tool of communication, but let's use it for what it is and don't let it control our lives and take us away from the things that we should be doing. <laughs> Mark thirteen thirty one. Heaven and earth will perish and pass away, but my words will not perish or pass away. It's all going to be gone someday, but this. And it won't come in the form of this book. It's going to come back riding on a white horse <laughs> with fire in his eyes and a robe dipped in blood with the name written across him, the Word of God. Amen will pass away, but my word will never pass away. I'll tell you another mission I'm on, and I don't intend to shut up about it. We are going to honor the word of God. Amen. Respect the word of God. Yes. Study the word of God. Believe the word of God. Stand strong for the word of God. And boy, I tell you what, when I finish tonight, in Revelation, where the Bible says, whew, what's going to happen to anybody who tries to add to the book or take away from it? Oh, man, we better be careful because we're living in days where that's about to happen. And you can't start taking stuff out of the Word or adding stuff to the Word. That's important to God. Mark thirteen thirty one. Verse 32, but of that day and hour, not a single person knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So really, don't waste your time reading stuff that tells you when the world's going to end. They don't know. You know why God's not going to tell us when? Because He wants us to live ready. He wants us to be ready all the time. We should be ready every day, not think, oh, I'm glad He's coming back on September 30th. Now I've got 12 more days to get ready. We're going to live ready. Live ready. Be on your guard constantly and watch and pray for you don't know when the time will come. It's like a man already going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge. That's us. Each with his particular task. And he gives orders to the doorkeeper to be constantly alert and on the watch. Every single one of us have an assignment from God. Every one of us has an assignment from God. Some are more... Uh, Focal assignments, some are more like platform assignments, but many, many, many assignments are little things that nobody but you and God know that you're doing, but what you're doing is just as important as what somebody else is doing. And we all need to do it with joy.
what's left is right Chasing stars and holding you I can't see the end, but we'll see it through Keep the sky on your mind 